Welcome back to AP World Simplified, and today we'll be discussing the age of exploration and the Columbian Exchange that took place in the early modern era from roughly 1450 to 1750 CE. Now, the early modern era is officially when the entire world, all habitable continents, are going to be connected by trade. That's going to be initiated or started by the Europeans and their desire to connect with the uh, markets of Asia in India and China uh, particularly. Now, the reason why they could not access these markets like they had been in previous eras was was uh, for two primary reasons. Uh, one being that the Mongolian Empire had dissolved at this point and the protected um, and consolidated Silk Road was no longer uh, cons consistent enough or operable for travelers and merchants to go from east to west. Additionally, thanks to some ideological differences with religion as well as the Crusades in the Middle East, Europeans, specifically Christians, and the Muslim states did not get along well enough for uh, Muslim states to allow these Christian merchants to travel through and connect with the East. So, as a result, the peoples of Europe are going to be looking for alternate routes to get to India and China. Now, the five primary states that are going to attempt to connect with the East are going to be the Atlantic states positioned on the Northern Atlantic, uh, Portugal, Spain, France, the Netherlands, and England. The first two, however, the ones that are really going to propel this exploration are going to be Portugal and Spain, and they have two different approaches. The approach of the Portuguese is going to be to navigate around Africa and find a route to come up from the south to India. The Spanish, on the other hand, theorized that you could go all the way around the world, that is, sail around the Atlantic and you would land, um, with the globe being spherical, in Asia somewhere. Now, they didn't know that the Americas were a set of continents in the way, but they were right in that the world was a sphere and you could connect east and west that way. Now, the Europeans were only able to do this thanks to several innovations they had either borrowed, invented, or modified from the from themselves, either that of the Arabs, uh, the Indians, or the Chinese. Uh, some of these were the compass and astrolabe coming from uh, China and some re revisions from the Arabs, as well as a new type of ship that was more maneuverable, yet could carry a sizable load uh, and crew known as a caravel. And these ships were able to maneuver in tight spaces and in currents that were otherwise unavailable to older models of ships like Junks and others because of the sternpost rudder. And the sternpost rudder was positioned um, at the back of the ship and that allowed sailors to, or captains, to harness the resistance of water and steer their ship much more effectively than just using sails. Additionally, through the use of the compass, they were allowed, or rather enabled, to create much more accurate maps, known as Portland maps. Now these maps were not as accurate as today's maps, obviously, what we have with satellite imaging and other things, but it was a remarkably accurate way to make maps back then. What they would do was they would use a compass to sail in a straight line, time how long it took them to reach certain areas starting from a particular port, and they used that to pretty accurately gauge distance and make some fairly accurate maps, which was important for mapping Africa and later the Americas so that other sailors could catch the correct currents and navigate that area appropriately. Speaking of currents, the Europeans also discovered a couple of currents that they're able to tap into uh, to go west, and that are gonna be the trade winds along the equator that run from roughly North Africa and dump you off in the Caribbean, as well as the westerlies that take you back up from North America and dump you off up in Northern Europe. Now these trips were not cheap. It was not cheap to afford a ship a crew and supplies for that ship. Not only was it expensive to, to field those, but also the odds of those ships coming back, especially in uncharted territories, is actually quite low, which made such ventures quite risky and expensive. So to pay for this, it required one or a combination of two methods. The, the first being royal patronage. So either a king, prince, queen, etc., or nobleman, or set of noblemen would fund these trips on their own, and of course reap the benefits of any gold, silver, or other goods that were brought back uh, through trade or discovery. The second way was a more open to the public or open to commoners method known as joint stock. And that is where a, a noble or non-noble investor could risk their money and fund a percentage of an exploration paying for a, let's say, 10% of the ship crew and supplies. Now, if that ship returns, 10% of those profits would go at least towards that investor. And the returns on these return trips, especially after the Americas were discovered, are going to be very, very high. Now, that would sort of make up for the fact that a lot of these ships would not come back, but to sort of 
reduce the amount of risk. Uh, these investors wouldn't just invest in one ship, they would invest portions of many ships so that even if half of them didn't come back, the other half did return uh, with some high dividends to be paid for their investment. Now these technologies and financial practices put together uh, would result in the Portuguese and Spanish first, followed later by the Netherlands, England, and France, would allow navigators uh, or at least royal patrons such as Henry, um, the navigator of Portugal, who actually didn't sail himself but funded several explorations, to map and chart the coast of West Africa, allowing uh, future sailors of Portugal, like Vasco da Gama, to finally round the uh, tip of Africa and make their way up to India. Now that wasn't as simple as it sounds. It wasn't as simple as just rounding the Cape of Africa. You, they actually had to tap into several different currents uh, to maneuver around and catch the correct current to bring them up into India. And that was actually a secret protected for several decades, punishable by death uh, by the Portuguese crown. The Spanish, on the other hand, adopted a different strategy of assuming that the world was a sphere, could sail west to connect themselves directly to China and India. And again, they did not know the Americas were an obstructive uh, set of continents in the way, but they were correct that this method would be efficient or effective. And they also hired out their sailors, as was a tendency of the time to especially hire Italian sailors who were adept at sailing, having navigated the Mediterranean Sea for several decades, and hiring Columbus. Now, Columbus would be funded by the Spanish crown under Ferdinand Isabella, and that would allow Columbus and his voyagers to set sail and inadvertently discover the Americas. And at first, they actually believed they landed in India, hence the misnomer of uh, calling Native Americans Indians, or even American Indians, as well as labeling uh, what is now the West Indies the West Indies, thinking that they had landed in or near India. Now, with this discovery of the Americas, would for the first time connect consistently the peoples of North and South America with the peoples of Afro-Eurasia, as well as an exchange of unique goods, resources, and even animals that were not available in the other continents. From, for example, the New World, many new goods were brought over to the Old World that were seen as incredibly valuable, especially earlier on. Uh, things like cacao, which is used to make chocolate, um, tobacco, which is a highly addictive substance, additionally, uh, pumpkin, squash, tomatoes, uh, corn, which would be used for a lot of livestock, um, feed, and other things like that, uh, as well as some diseases, including syphilis. This exchange of goods uh, from the New to Old World and Old World to New World is known as the Columbian Exchange. Um, from the Old World, you also have the uh, transport of many different goods and animals such as livestock. You also have the bringing over of rice, okra, um, other substances such as sugar and coffee to be grown in, grown in plantations in the Americas, uh, as well as many of the Old World diseases such as measles, smallpox, and others. Now the West would benefit disproportionately from this connection as they were the ones that had access to the goods of the Americas as well as the ability to sell them to people of Afro-Eurasia for a high profit. Additionally, the populations of the Old World would increase substantially because bringing over corn and potatoes and sweet potatoes offered several sources of highly calorie-dense foods that would help to increase the populations of the Old World, as many of the diseases that existed in the New World were not, at least as quickly, deadly to the populations of the Old World. The New World, on the other hand, uh, would suffer massive population loss due to the introduction of diseases from the Old World, such as smallpox and measles, that Europeans, Africans, and Asians had largely grown uh, immune to over the years due to exposure to these diseases from livestock. However, when it arrived in the Americas, it would wipe out roughly 90%, as, as most modern estimates sort of place it, roughly 90% of Native Americans would end up dying from these diseases completely unintentionally uh, by their introduction from the Europeans. Additionally, the West would largely benefit from their uh, ventures into the Americas, returning with uh, lots of with high amounts of gold, silver, other precious metals, as well as some of the addictive substances um, and foods, uh, such as tobacco and uh, potatoes and corn, that were highly sought in the old world once they were introduced. And because these goods were so rare and it was so difficult to um, expedite them over to the old world, the profits on them were incredibly high. And that's going to allow the peoples of Spain, especially, and Portugal, as well as England, the Netherlands, and France later, as the other three followed, to benefit substantially from this 
exposure to and settlement of other areas of the world. Now, conquests of these areas of the New World and Old World were made much easier for Europeans due to their innovations in uh, gunpowder and rifle and cannon making. Now, particularly the Portuguese, they were able to profit substantially in the Old World by bombing and controlling many of the trade ports of the Indian Ocean uh, as well as near Africa. Now, while they weren't able to yet field armies that would conquer these um, empires that existed already, such as the Mughal Empire and Safavid and Ottoman and others that existed in Qing and Ming dynasties, they would be able to at least bomb these port cities into surrender, and that allowed them to control and facilitate trade in the region, and they would charge for that with a tax known as the, or a, a trade marker known as the Cartes. Um, the Dutch and English would later take that trading right and privilege from the Portuguese and, and take over it for themselves, charging people, of course, to facilitate and engage in that trade. But the Europeans in the Old World would benefit initially by controlling and also increasing the amount of trade within the Old World. In the New World, however, largely due to the efforts of Spain, conquest-based empires would be formed based on taking the land that they could in the Americas from the natives or, or whatever, and then using it to harvest resources through plantations, ranches, and mines, and use those to send back to Europe uh, to enrich the mother country. This is known as colonialism, when Europeans would conquer an area or settle an area, and then use that area to harvest for natural resources, sending most of the profits back to the mother country in Europe for the purpose of enriching the peoples of Europe, as well as some of the colonists that took part in that process. Due to Portugal and Spain reaching the Old World trade ports as well as the New World first, they got dibs or claims on most of the habitable areas, uh, forming New Spain in the Americas, Brazil uh, with Portugal in South America, as well as getting establishing a trade post empire along the port cities of the Indian Ocean. However, over time, the commercialization practices and private property rights of the Dutch and the English, and to a lesser extent the French, would allow them to take greater and greater portions of the Spanish, Portuguese, and greater world uh, and, and accrue it more towards uh, the British and French and Dutch empires. Of course, one of the highest demands, especially in the New World, was the need for labor. Now, while the Europeans did initially utilize uh, a lot of Native American workers, uh, especially with the Spanish in the Incan areas adopting the Olmeda system, the Native workers uh, quickly died off due to exposure to disease. So to supplement these laborers, uh, labor was brought over from the Old World. Uh, the most notable, of course, was the slave trade set up by the Portuguese in West Africa, in which uh, slaves were purchased from West African kingdoms mostly and sent across the Atlantic in what is called the Middle Passage. And on that treacherous missile, Middle Passage where they're exposed to close quarters, disease, death, starvation, um, etc., they were then sold um, in the New World to plantation owners, um, and they served as slaves on these plantations and mines. The profits of which were then sent, of course, to Europe, which those profits were used to enrich Europe and purchase more slaves, which fed its own system in a system known as the Atlantic system or triangular trade. Another form of labor came directly from Europe, uh, referred to as indentured servitude, which is where European uh, poor and peasant class citizens would essentially contract themselves out to companies or individuals in the new world. Those individuals or companies would pay for their expensive voyage and they would be repaid by the uh, service of free labor, labor for two, three, four, five, six, seven years by these indentured servants who were escaping either uh, the religious wars, famine, disease, overcrowding, overtaxation that was taking place in Europe in the late post-classical and the early portions of the early modern era. Now, while there's much more that could be said about exploration as well as the early portions of the early modern era, that will end our video today for AP World Simplified. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my website at morganabteaching.com for other resources and videos to help both AP World students and teachers alike. Thanks for watching.